Man, I'm really excited that you're here and looking forward to our summer at the center. I hope that you've had a moment uh, today to kind of get a lay of the land, to walk around, see where the bathrooms are, check out where kids check in is. If you hadn't had the opportunity to get a lay of the land, do it after service instead of just jetting out of here, walk around for a minute, make a friend. Uh, I already said it, but our team has done an incredible job over the last three weeks. Come on, pulling this whole thing off. We had to get banners ordered and new kid stuff and a bunch of wire co adapter connector thingamajobs that made everything work. And man, they've done an incredible job pulling the thing off. Uh, as I've been thinking this week, I realized that three years ago, we were at Aristide, or no, we were at Matlock doing four Sunday morning service. How many of you guys were back there with us in the four service? Man, come on, give it up for yourselves. You've been here. I remember when we were doing four services on Sunday, 8.30, 10, 11.30, and 1. That was a job. That was a job. Four services was a job, and then the church was growing, and we were running out of room. All four of those services were full, and so we bought land, and we were planning and pushing to be able to break ground, but then this little thing, I don't know if you heard of it, uh, coronavirus, this little thing happened, and so it kind of threw a wrench in the monkey gears of the timeline, and so we weren't doing exactly what we had planned on, because who knows that our plans are not always God's plans, and so, and so we knew it was going to take a couple of years to build a building, and we're still working on that process, but we didn't want to wait years to keep reaching people, and so God spoke to us, and he told us to move the church to Willie Pig Auditorium, and so we did that. We did this crazy, like, wild, stupid thing where we sold the building we owned, and then we went, set up, and tear down on Sundays so we could start reaching more people. And I remember uh, the Sunday at our Matlock location making the announcement. We made the announcement that we we're going to make the move and we're going to go to the pig. And we printed a thousand red t-shirts. We gave the red t-shirts to everybody and they said, it's not about the... Travis got on right now. Travis rocking right now. It's not, it's not, yeah, we got a couple. It's not about the building. And guess what? It's still not about the building. That the, the ministry that God's doing through more church, it has nothing to do with a building. It has nothing to do with a facility. This is just, this is not a sanctuary. This is not a tabernacle. This is a building. But we are the church. We, we're, we're the church that where we go, that that's where God goes. And so over the years, I remember when we began, uh, we started, we've been in a lot of buildings. More church has been in a lot of different buildings uh, over the years. I remember we were at uh, Holiday Inn when we started. We went to Holiday Inn, come on, Holiday Inn Express, and so we had some services there. Then we went to Aristide Event Center, a wedding venue. We had some services there for a little while. We were at Willie Brown Elementary School. That was Amanda Stuckey's very first Sunday. She came there, because there's no such thing as just another Sunday. That was not good. It looked like garbage, but guess what? Somebody came, their life was changed. Now she's leading all kind of stuff here. We were there for a little while. Then we were at Herb's Bar and Grill, if you remember uh, this building. I don't know if we got a picture of that one. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, Roman Coliseum action. So we were there for a little while. We had some services at the MAC, the Mansfield, uh, what is this? I don't even know what they, activity center. They play basketball, and we had church. And so we were at the MAC for uh, a minute having services. Then we moved to our Matlock location where a lot of you guys were. Then, then we moved to the Pig. You many you've been to the pig? Then uh, COVID, we went to the land, and so we had services outside on a trailer. That was exciting. And, uh, and then we acquired our North Campus, and so we've had a bunch of ministry at the North Campus. And then now here we are at the center. It's quite, quite, quite the journey. You know, some churches, <laughs> some churches, they show up to the same place every week. It's awesome, right? It's like, what? like like 52 weeks a year, they go to the same place, and then they do that for like 100 years in a row. Oh, here at Moore Church, do you remember when you were a kid and you had that book, Where's Waldo? That's basically what we're doing. Like, where, where are they at? What's going on? It's like, where's Waldo around here? But you know, every time we've had a move, every time we've faced challenges, uh, God's been with us. I I've talked with a lot of pastors over the last year, and they say, Pastor Tristan, I don't know how y'all are doing it. How, how are you having all these challenges with COVID and not having a building and still growing and doing set up and tear down? And I have one answer, favor. That, that God's favor is with us, that God is with us, he's for us. God's favor is his preferential treatment, that he treats his kids good. 
And that God says, you know what, no matter where you go, I'm going to be with you. Because here at More Church, we believe there's no such thing as just another Sunday. And so whether we're in a big, beautiful facility or we're out in a field in the Texas heat, there's no such thing as just another Sunday. That we're going to talk about the goodness of Jesus and so God's had favor on us. We believe that uh, no matter where we are, we're going to start parties on earth so we can start parties in heaven. Because it doesn't matter where we are, but people want to accept Jesus into their heart. We believe, maybe most important, that there's more. That there's more lives that need to be changed. There's more families that need to be restored. There's more kids that need to learn their identity in Jesus that we believe that there's more. And so I just want to say at the top of the summer, we will advance this summer. We will advance. We will grow. We will take ground for the kingdom of God. We're going to thrive. This is not going to be a season that we're shifting buildings. There's going to be a decline. But through God's favor, there will be increase, not only in this house, but in your house. So come on, clap that up. It's the same thing that God told the exiles when the, his people got exiled to Babylon. He said in Jeremiah 29, 5 and 6, God commanded his people to increase in number and not decrease. We're going to increase, not decrease, as we're here over the summer. And so the plan, the plan, <laughs> I think God looks at my plans and he's like, you're cute, you know? And so the, the plan is that we're going to be here for the next eight weeks, 10 weeks. They're doing some renovations at the pig, and we'll see how all that goes. And the plan is that we'll move back there when school starts. But who knows what God has up his sleeve? I don't know what he's doing up there. We're just uh, doing our very best to hear what he says and take the next step. God speaks, we move. God speaks, we move. God speaks, we move. This, this is the rhythm of health, and so that's just what we're trying uh, to do. Jesus, he said this to us in Matthew 6.18. He said, I will build my church, and the power of hell will not conquer it. Jesus is building the church, that he's the one who's advancing uh, the kingdom. What I love that Jesus didn't say, he didn't say, I will build my church if you own your own building. He didn't say, I will build my church if you have a building that has all the amenities that can compete with other things in the area. Uh, Listen, I know what we got and what we don't got. I know we don't have like a big play place for the kids with slides. We will someday. Uh, It's going to be, you think I'm crazy? Just, I I literally have a vision of what it's going to be. We're going to have all those things. We don't yet. But the good thing is Jesus didn't say that we had to have all of that to keep reaching People. What Jesus didn't say, he didn't say that for the church to advance, it needed to be easy for everyone who came. Because if you come to more church, it's kind of hard. <laughs> this is the hardest church to go to, I think. We tell you, you got to show up early. Where are you going to meet? You got to unload some trailers and stuff. You got to bring a change of clothes because it's so hot for tearing. But Jesus said, None of that matters. He says, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so someday, we're going to have a big, beautiful building. It's going to be amazing and spectacular and have all the amenities. And we're all going to look back at these hard days where we're going to say, but God did it anyways. And so, man, I'm excited and encouraged uh, today about all that's happening. So uh, I just flew back from Africa. Uh, Rachel and I and Aaron Whitney, we went to Africa for 12 days. We were over there and, dude, we had a ton of fun. And uh, the whole time I was there, I was singing Lion King, like every single. I was like, how's it been, yeah? How did I see more, right? I'm not waiting for the interpretation. That's a song from the Lion King. And so, and I know they're not the words, but I was singing Lion King uh, for a week while we were over there, and it was amazing. Uh, We were there leading a conference of church planters and missionaries from seven different nations of Africa came together for this conference. And we had the privilege to preach and to teach and to lead and to just have some conversations with men and women about how they can grow and reach people there. We were able to pray for for some pastors and answer some questions. We taught them our church values. We gave them some very practical tools. You know, there's this amazing thing happening in Africa, that there's all of this development happening now in urban cities. Sometimes we think Africa and we only think like huts, you know, safari, right? But, but there's actually gigantic cities that are starting to develop and people are moving into these urban centers. And so missionaries have to shift their tactics. They're now planting churches in these urban areas. And I think we know a little bit something about starting a church and having to move locations. And so our things that we're learning, we've been able to help advance them And so, man, it's been a ton of fun. 
when I was a youth pastor, it feels like a lifetime ago and three months ago, when I was a youth pastor, uh, I led a missions trip to Durban, South Africa. And so I had a ton of fun preaching. There's a picture. I used to have hair, so that existed <laughs> at one point in my life. I've still got it here, but back here is, a, is, a, is another story. And so, and so uh, we led this trip, and I took a group of maybe 20 teenagers with me on this uh, missions trip to Durban, South Africa. And so that's me on the far left. And so I remember this trip, and then I remember that my friend uh, Amy Chin went on the trip with us. Amy, are you here? Amy and Vince? Amy, right here. So me and Amy, we've been friends for a long time. And so uh, Amy's there in the photo stand. There's me. There's Amy right next to me. And so I text Amy. I said, Amy, do you have any pictures from this trip? Because, like, I just threw all that junk away, I think, somewhere. And so Amy was like, actually, and she get, like within a minute, she was like, here's a photo. It's like, how did you categorize this? How did you do this? And so, so there's me and Amy. But there was a girl on the trip with us whose name was Sarah. And so Sarah on this trip was 15, 16 years old. We led this trip to Durban, South Africa. And while we were there on the trip, during a time that we were praying, she felt like God told her that she was called to be a missionary to Durban, South Africa. And I was like, that's cool. You know, I'm a youth pastor. I'm like, her dad's going to be mad when she comes home <laughs> and says this. And so all this time went by. And about four years ago, I got a call from Sarah. I said, Pastor Trustin, you remember this trip? Yeah, I remember. She said, my husband Aaron and I are getting ready to move to Durban, South Africa to be missionaries. And so we've been supporting them for the last four years. I've told the story before about how we brought them on as missionaries. And so the Lord told us to support them. We started giving them $1,000 a month. And dude, that was the bad. I was like, God, that's more than I'm paying Pastor Whitney a month. Like, what you talking about? And God said, I need you to trust me. And so when you step out in faith, God always delivers. And so we've been supporting them, and it's incredible because the, ch the, the church that they're now pastoring was leading this conference. That now church planters from all across the nation are coming together, leading this through an organization called Urban Tribes, where it's not just tribes, but they're tribes in urban areas. And so it's incredible to see God go full circle him call a girl and her be obedient to God's call. And then now they're over there doing incredible things, reaching people far from God. And so we had a ton of fun uh, and they worked us hard. It was preaching and teaching and ask, answering questions. I, I need a vacation from my trip. And so it was a lot of fun. And while we were there, Urban Tribes is starting a whole other campus in Cape Town, which Cape Town is beautiful. If you ever get to travel, it's an unbelievable city. And so while we were there, we met some other church planners and they started a church in their home, just with a few people, and it's quickly grown to over 60 people in their home. You can't fit 60 people in your house, you know, and so they finally just acquired their very first building, and we were celebrating with them, and so I asked the pastor, well, what, what are some things we can be praying with you about? What are some challenges you're facing? He said, well, we've got this building, but we have no chairs. I said, okay, well, that's not good. I said, well, how many chairs do you think we need? He said, well, we got about 60 people coming on a Sunday, and so I thought, well, 60 people, but you know, there's more. And, and so we, you, bought them 300 chairs last week. And so now they get the opportunity to keep reaching people. And you, you, if you give here to more church, you see, you don't give to a church, you give through a church. And so we now are partnering with another church on the other side of the globe. That's doing, they just had a baptism service and baptized three people for the very first time. It's incredible to see what God's doing. And, and you did that because, because you gave. So thank you for being faithful. Thank you for giving. It's good. I could get really emotional there, but I got it. I got it. I, it's the circle. It's the circle. It's the circle. The circle of life. Right, okay. The circle of life. It's what's going on. But, you know, it's good to be home. It's good to be home. We're starting a brand new series uh, today that's going to carry us through the summer. That here, as we're at Summer of the Center, we're going to be in one series, and it's still in alignment with the year of Jesus. You know, we felt like in January, God said, all year, 52 weeks, Jesus, nothing but Jesus. So that's what we've been doing. And so for the summer, we're going to take some time to go all the way up, like Jesus did. One day, Jesus, he climbed a mountain, and he preached a sermon to his disciples. We know it as the Sermon on the Mount. And so this summer, we're going to go all the way up the mountain with Jesus, and we're going to look at this incredible teaching that he gave to his disciples. It's found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. 
So I'd encourage you to read it this week as you get some time, but let me read what happened right before Jesus starts preaching this incredible sermon. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, that's churches, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him, TMZ found out, and it spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering from severe pain and demonic oppression, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. He didn't care what their problem was. He healed it, and he still doesn't. He doesn't care your physical, mental, emotional. It doesn't matter. Jesus wants to heal the issues in your life. And it says, a large crowd from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the regions across the Jordan followed him. A large crowd followed him. A large crowd followed him. This big crowd of people saw Jesus do miracles, and they followed him because they wanted to see the show. They wanted to see the show. Wait, he did what? That's crazy. I'm going to go follow this dude. There's nothing good on, on TV tonight. I'm going to go follow Jesus and see, see what he's doing. They wanted to see a show, but, but it says something really interesting in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up, all the way up, on a mountaintop, and he sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. So there's this big crowd but Jesus leaves the crowd and he goes a little bit higher and then he teaches his disciples. There's a difference. The crowd was following to watch the show, but the disciples wanted to sit and learn. And at more Church, we're a church of disciples. We're a church of people who don't just want to see the show. It's not a performance. But we're a group of people that want to learn about who Jesus is and what he says and what he teaches. And so he began to teach them, and we talked earlier in the year about the disciples of Jesus, that they're a ragtag, motley crew. These dudes were getting in fights down on the seashore. These are some sketchy dudes cussing people out, and that's kind of what more church is made of, like, well, a bunch of thugs. It's this group of people that don't always fit, like, with your normal church idea that God has surrounded around him, and he starts to teach them some things. And so I really do have some homework for you this week. The homework is that I want you to just go to Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and I want you to take some time and read it. I want you to read the Sermon on the Mount. You could read it in 10 minutes in the three chapters, but I'd love for you to read it over 30 minutes. Schedule 10 minutes, read a chapter. The next day, schedule another 10, read the next, cha next chapter. I want you to hear the whole sermon that Jesus teaches because it's an incredible thing. Because all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is drawing this contrast He's comparing and contrasting the culture of the day, the religion of the day, to what his followers, his disciples, should feel and think and how they should act and how they should respond. He's comparing and contrasting the norm to the new that he's teaching. He's comparing and contrasting. He's contrasting how everyone else does life and how we as disciples of him should do life. He's drawing this picture of what man says in religion compared to what God has to say to us. He's talking about religious demands, demands of religion, and he's comparing them to relationships with our God. That relationship with God delivers something as religion demands something. The relationship delivers, the religion demands. And so Jesus is setting this contrast up throughout his whole message through some Genius introductory sentences. I'm a communicator, so I love to see how Jesus communicates. He has these introductory sentences that if you read it, you'll see time and time again. He says things like, you have heard it said, but I say. He's like, you've been hearing this, but here's what I say about it. Jesus, he uses this other sentence. He says, the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. I know how you do it here on earth, he's saying. I know how man says it needs to be done. But here's what heaven says. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about all these incredible ideas. Like this wide breadth of concepts he's able to seamlessly tag together. He talks about how to be blessed. I don't know about you, but I want to live a life that's blessed. He talks about how to be happy and fulfilled. He talks about loving others, forgiving others. That's a hard one. He talks about judging others. He talks about hate talks about lust. Uh-oh. 
He talks about commitment. He talks about generosity. He talks about dealing with worry. Pastor Whitney used some of those verses just a few weeks ago from the Sermon on the Mount. He talks to us about prayer and fasting. And he's explaining to his disciples that we are called to live differently. That, 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 it's, that we're called to live differently. What he really is doing is he's redefining the culture of Christianity. He's redefining some culture. When we were in uh, South Africa, we realized that there were a couple cultural differences. Some cultural differences. Now, I've joked before that Pastor Whitney, if you get her uh, mad or she slams her finger in the door or something, she might let a cuss word out every once in a while. <laughs> I've just talked about it. And so every once in a while... Every once in a while, Whitney, Whitney, Whitney will let one slip, and me and Aaron will be like, man, what's going on over there? And so, <laughs> and so we go to help these missionaries, and so Whitney's on her best behavior. <laughs> it's true. She said it's true. And so, and so we get there, and we find out something. We're, uh, Whitney's leading a session, and she's interviewing some missionaries. And the missionaries start telling the story about what they're dealing with and how hard it is. And then the guy just kind of stops talking. And Whitney is like, okay, how do I transition out of this? And she says, well, crap, that must be really hard. <laughs> now, here in America, the word crap is like, eh, you don't want your seven-year-old saying it, right? But like, you know, it's not that bad. Well, in Africa, uh, the, the, the S word, shish kebab, right? The S word that starts with four letters, that means crap, and crap is a really horrible swear word. And so when he's leading the session and she says, well, crap. And the whole room's like, oh, and they, they like, what did the pastor from America just say? And the room's completely silent except for me dying laughing on the front row because I'm like, wherever she goes, she can't quit swearing. Wherever she is, it's just, just kidding. That really did happen. But while we were there, we had to redefine culture. Words that are allowed here are not allowed there. Jesus, in this moment with his disciples, he's redefining some culture. In this day, the only way for someone to be saved and go to heaven was through their works, was through obeying all the rules, was by following the law. People in that day had to earn their salvation. Moses he gave the Ten Commandments, right? All the thou shall nots. Thou shall not do this, thou shall not do that, all the commandments. And then a bunch of priests and prophets come along and they add over 600 more rules. That's a lot, right? Moses had 10, like I'm down with 10. Like I can remember 10. But you start adding hundreds of rules, I'm out. Like I'm not gonna remember them. I'm gonna start screwing stuff up all over the place. And they add all these crazy rules of how you must be saved. They say you can go here and you, you, you can't go there. You've got to make this kind of sacrifice on this day. You've got to get this animal and cut it up like that and put this here and sprinkle some stuff and have some music going. They say that you've got to light a fire on this day and not one on that day. You've got to wear these kind of clothes. They've got to be this color and this clean. You can't have this fabric with this fabric. Here's how you've got to cut your hair. You've got to cut it here and let some long sideburns grow. They have all these different weird rules that people have to follow so that they can be saved. And it was really confusing. It was really confusing, it was super expensive, and it was really hard to do right. And if you didn't follow all the rules and do it right, you were no longer righteous. If you didn't do it right, you weren't righteous. And if you're not righteous, you can't be in relationship with God, and so that caused a major problem. If you followed all the rules of the prophets, then you were righteous. You wanted to be close to God, you had to follow all the rules. But the disciples, who knew all the rules, were epically failing at following all of them as I am in my life many times. I know what I should do, but I do the exact opposite of the thing that I know that I should do. This is what the disciples were doing, and because of that, they weren't righteous. Now, in that day, there was a group of people called the priests, the Pharisees, and their job was to follow all the rules and enforce them. You ever had someone look down their nose at you? That's like these guys' job descriptions. Like, number one job description, be a jerk to everyone, right? And so, so these guys are judging everybody for the mistakes that they're making. And then Jesus is teaching this sermon. Big crowd, people that watch just want to stay down, but the people that want to learn follow him. And Jesus says something that would have been really shocking and confusing to the disciples. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, it's in the intro of his sermon. Jesus says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness 
surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, all of the rules. If you don't do better than them, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And I can imagine the disciples are like, say what? <laughs> so y'all are nervous because you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> you're like, ah. They're sitting there shocked. They're like, Jesus, the Pharisees, their whole career is knowing these rules and following them. And you're saying that we have to be more righteous than they are? Jesus, that sounds impossible. I, I don't know how I'm supposed to do that. The disciples are thinking that they're doomed. Well, the truth is, you can't be more righteous than the Pharisees, and neither can I. Right now, today, I cannot, with all of my strength, be more righteous than the Pharisees were. But that's why Jesus came. Now, we're about to go deep, deep. We're about to go Barry White deep up in here for, for just a minute. You're going to be okay. So I need you to put your thinking cap on and really pay. We're going to get in some deep verses, but we're learners. We're not just here for the show. We're here to learn some deep truth. So Jesus, he tells them, you have to be better at following the rules than the Pharisees if you want to be righteous. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says this. For God made Christ, that's Jesus, who never sinned. He did it perfect. Who never sinned to be the offering for our sin. That means that we don't have to keep making sacrifices to be right with God that Jesus was the sacrifice for us. And it says, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. That's good news. That Jesus says that you must become more righteous than the Pharisees, but you don't do it through your power, we do it through his power. That it's in Jesus that we become righteous. So in that day, you had to follow the law to be right with God. And in our day, what religion speaks many times is that we have to follow all the rules. But Jesus is saying that we either live a life trying to follow the rules or just accept his forgiveness. And I've battled with this my whole life because I want to do it all right. I want to do it all right, but I keep doing a lot of it wrong. And so that's where grace comes in, that we learn to forgive ourselves, that we learn to accept God's forgiveness, that we don't have to earn it, we just have to accept it. We have to accept it. We have to just accept the forgiveness that God offers. Romans chapter 3, verse 12, it says this, we are made right, that's righteous, we are made righteous with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are that our righteousness is determined by who we believe in, not by the acts that we're able to do. Now we're going deep. I got one more. Everyone say, I'm okay. Okay, okay one more. Galatians chapter three, verse, I love y'all. You know what I'm saying? I know when it starts to get heavy. I'm like, I haven't told a funny story in a minute. I know. Okay. Galatians chapter three, verse 24. The law, that's all the rules. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right, righteous, with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, that's Jesus, we no longer need the law as our guardian. For, come on. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. My, 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 Easter, my Easter message, right? You were here for Easter, where I put all the jackets on and changed out all the jackets. That was not me being creative. That was me just stealing what the Bible says. It says right here that, and those who have been united, united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. That when we accept Jesus into our heart, we put on his righteousness. We don't have to show up to God in our righteousness because our righteousness is not good enough. Now that you belong to Christ, you are true children. You're welcome in the house. You're welcome in the house. You're welcome at the after party. You're a part of what God is doing in the earth because of what he's done for us. So I want you to read it this week. I don't want you to just hear me talk about the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to take 30 minutes. Let me tell you something. We'd be wasting 30 minutes all over the place. We would, dude... 
I'll be laying in bed, tired as a mug, looking at my cell phone. Y'all know you're just as stupid as me, and you do it too, right? Man, I got to get up at 6 o'clock. Why am I looking at my cell phone at 11.30? I'm stupid. What am I doing? Listen, this week, 30 minutes. Let's read through this and get this truth in our heart. What Jesus is really doing in the Sermon on the Mount is he's moving us beyond the rigidity of the rules and into the rhythm of relationship with God. He's moving us from the rigidity of the rules. Because rules are rigid. And he's moving us into a rhythm of a relationship of how to understand who God is and what he wants us to be. He wants us to understand how to think, not just what to do. When I was a kid, my mom and dad had so many rules for me. And I needed them. (laughs) Because I was acting a fool all the time. I had rules of where I could go and rules where I couldn't go. Rules of who I could talk to and rules of who I couldn't talk to. Rules about where I could ride my bike and where I couldn't ride my bike. Rules that I could only eat three cookies, not the whole box. Come on, somebody. They had all these rules. Trusting you must put on pants before you leave the house. I had all kind of rules my whole life that my parents had for me. Everywhere I went, rules. I'd go to a friend's house. Their parents would have rules for how I had to act in their house. i go to school. I had rules at school. I went to church. My kid's pastor had some rules for me. Everywhere I went, there were these rules that were my guardian. These rules helped me stay in line. These rules help me not get myself into trouble. But, but my, God, help them, help them get this, help them get this. But, but my parents' only hope is that I would be able to mature beyond the rigidity of the rules and because of my relationship with them, fall into a rhythm of life. Okay. This morning, my mom did not have to show up to my house to wake me up. Do you want to know why? Because for a lot of years, the rules and our relationship matured me into a rhythm of life. I'm a productive member of society because my mom helped me find a rhythm. The rules can help us find a rhythm. The rules give us some boundaries. The rules help us understand, ooh, nope, that's painful. Ooh, that's going to learn to some issues, some heartache in my life. Oh, I shouldn't do that. The rules are a guardian but it's through a real relationship with God that we can find a rhythm. And people, they live their lives never understanding this and they just feel like failures all the time because they just can't follow all the rules. Me me neither. Paul, one of the greatest apostles in the Bible, he said that his righteousness was like filthy rags. He he couldn't do it all right, but he he fell into this rhythm because of his relationship. Jesus wants us to learn how to think, not just the rules of what to do. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, he's challenging not only what we're doing, but what we're thinking, our emotions, our thought processes, not only what's on the outside, but, but, but he's talking about what's going on on the inside. Jesus, he talks about, he says, y'all have heard it said that thou shall not kill. And everyone's like, Yeah. I've heard that, Jesus. And he says, but I say that you should not have hate in your heart against your brother. The rule, don't murder. But the rhythm of life is deal with hate and unforgiveness that he's trying to get us to learn how to think. If, if God would have had to write down every rule for us to navigate life, think about how many rules he would have had to write. We have different scenarios and situations and circumstances. I've had people say, well, Pastor, it doesn't say in the Bible. And I'm like, well, right. I know it doesn't say in the Bible like this exact situation about your exact circumstance of life. Because if it had to have every circumstance, this book would be like 100 miles tall and we would never read it all. And so Jesus isn't just giving us rules. He's giving us rhythms of how to think and how to feel and how to process information and through the sermon on the mount he's helping us understand that how everyone else does life is not how his disciples should do life so i want you to read it this week and i want you to read it not as rules that you must figure out or you're doomed but understand that you live under grace and understand that we're already wearing his righteousness that we're showing up wrapped in his righteousness and now through relationships we learn some rhythms 
of life. It's not just about our actions, but about our attitudes. Ooh, that's a hard word. I, it's not just about our actions, but our attitudes, man. It's not just about what we do, but about what we think. It's not just about the outside, but about, about the inside. Now, there is right and wrong. <laughs> uh, there are things that we shouldn't do. The Bible says, do not just let grace abound that you would continue sinning. So it's not taking advantage of God's grace. It's understanding that we need it and we just have to accept it. So, that's good. It's not that we're uh, living our life It's not that we're living our life under rules, but we're building our life on top of relationship. When people say, I don't like church, I don't do the church thing. I tried that, it didn't work for me, I'm not a church person. Like, I know, it's because of all the rules. But it's not that we're trying to live under rules. We're trying to build a life on top of a relationship. Because when we have a relationship with God, we start to learn the rhythms of life. And we learn when we do something that's breaking a rule, it actually hurts us. Okay. I, I, got, I, got, I, got, I got one more verse that's out of Sermon on the Mount. So the first one was in his intro. This one's in his conclusion. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. The narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. I can imagine he's got this big crowd of people at the foot of the mountain. And he says, and he says uh, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. All of these people that just came for the show, they enter through the wide gate. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So a lot of people you know, America is supposed to be like 80% Christian. I wish, that, I wish that was true. That's why I work every day as hard as I can to try to help people meet Jesus. We need to understand who, who God is. Wide is the gate and narrow is the path. You might say, well, then what's the path? What's the door? What am I supposed to walk through? Jesus says in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. We don't earn salvation. We accept salvation. And then after we accept salvation, we're supposed to have a relationship with God. And it's upon that relationship that we build a rhythm of life. And that rhythm of life, it helps us make choices that honor God. And so if you've been beating yourself up about making bad choices, maybe instead of trying, quitting beating yourself from doing a bad job, just work on your relationship with Jesus. Like, like this, you, you have an opportunity this week. All of you have a Bible. Here's how I know that. You own a cell phone. And if you don't, we'll give you a free Bible. It's leather bound and it's in the lobby. I don't know where it is. We moved buildings last week. I don't know where it is. It's out there in the lobby. We have a free Bible for you. Matthew. It's like near, it's like uh, probably like, here's, here's Matthew. It's that far. It's that far in the book, right? Matthew. I'm on page 896. You're probably a different page. I want you to read it this week. Three chapters. You have an opportunity to grow in your relationship with God. And some of it is going to rub you the wrong way. Some of it rubs me the wrong way because I'm screwing it up still. I don't forgive everybody, right? I read it and I go, man, I'm a loser. Thank God for grace. Man, I'm, I'm being such a bum right now. But thank you that God still loves me and calls me a son. Yes. 